thing that obviously came in mind way back when our friends actually first thought how they were build the large language models. They had nobody seen to indicate that it was going to be open source, but it wasn't. So, Asanki and I, um, we've uh, both had a background in working in open source security specifically. And one of the immediate thought processes that we had once uh, this started to with the foundation of people, and, and once a lot of open source products Models are coming about with you know what are the applications, when will open source kind of keep pace with what is happening from a commercial standpoint, uh, when do we train our models and new brown models? And just in the time between when we proposed this to now and to bring this everything has changed, right? People thought we would not be able to run large number models locally for a year, but now we're running with them on the MacBooks and the Nama and the Chinchilla and, and, and it just never ends. But uh, what we're gonna talk about is is kind of a, a specific part. We are looking at large language models for code. Again, when we first started, there were separated models for code. Even OpenAI had Codex, and now it's no longer there. Uh, it seems that there may be just general purpose uh, large language models. But then the list goes on, right? Um, all the way from CodeBird, which was kind of the pioneer in some sort, some, some sense, to AlphaCode, CodeGen, and then this Codex. Um, Tango Coder, for those who don't know, is uh, Huawei's um, code generating LLM. Um, for Pilot is a version of Copilot, which kind of trying to do Llama or Crane on on on, on data two days ago. This morning, Amazon made uh, public code whisperer, so everybody can use it. And it's free for individual developers. So, so code generation for that model is great. Um, I don't know about your experience, but my experience with using Chat GPT machine learning code was similar to how I used Stack Overflow. I remember it looking back at that time where you were like, great, I just need to ask it and they'll fix it for me. I need to think about how to actually fix it. So 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 there's this meme. I, I really liked it. I know people are crying about the damn feedback of AI and the takeaway that jobs, but I think that was generally happy. Like less body code to write, less unit testing, less fixing of stuff. Um, so that's great. Um, no more readability, no more comments, and so on. So, so large language models of code are existing, and there's open source, there's commercial models. I think in the long run, open source models win, as we have seen with all software, right? Uh, open source models will be kind of the defining victory. And, and there are certain things beyond what open source generally does um, for software. Uh, there's certain principles that we all are aware of. But when it comes to specifically uh, large language models and AI, there are a few additional advantages that you know we see. One is uh, data security and privacy. Like um, the ability to train uh, models on your own data securely without having to give it to a third party, that seems like a major win. Um, alignment and security seems to be another win from a decentralization standpoint. Uh, you know, like if, if you believe that the collective wisdom is what will help us define alignment for AI, um, then obviously building an open source model will be the best, better outcome. Uh, there's also cost advantages as it stands right now. Large language models will always be uh, computationally and, as a result, commercially expensive. So, open source models should win out uh, in the long run for that. And there are other aspects like uh, training data. Um, if you are releasing an open source model and, and we were to just do a very simplistic extension of the open source code licensing uh, models out there, you could theoretically train on a lot more data because uh, you're open sourcing your output. So, as a result, uh, you could Theoretically, you train on GBL3, uh, GBL data or any kind of copy lab data as well, as long as you are able to reciprocate the license and so on. So it opens up much larger data sets for you. So we think open source models should win. And then when we look at uh, coding, though, there is still obviously a gap. Now, that's the long run. In the short run, uh, the coding models aren't that good, right? Or any open source model isn't yet that good. We're getting there, but there is a big difference. So when you look at code generation, which is your left to right code generation, writing new code, right? Boilerplate code, asking it to write a certain amount of code for a given problem statement, the commercial models do a very good job. But then as Asankhya and I were talking, one thing that we realized is a lot of code writing is actually not doing uh, left to right code generation from scratch. It is actually editing code. It's about fixing code, it's about maintaining code, it's about extending and modifying code. So when you look at something called fill in the middle, which is kind of on the right side, these are aspects when you're basically saying that there's a preceding code and a, and a postscript code, and then you, you ask the large language model to generate code to fill in the middle. 
And based on the research that was available, it became very clear that while for code generation, your open source model like CodeGen and Santa Cora had a very low uh, pass at one rate. Pass at one, I think, is, is just to simplify, is basically multiply that number by 100 is the percentage rate of success at the first attempt that you ask the LLM or the AI to do something, right? So, so you would have very varying differences between commercial models and open source models. But when you came to fill in the middle uh, for code generation, the difference was a lot smaller. And in fact, you had open source models being a little bit better. Um, why is that? Well, there, there are a lot of speculations in terms of why that is. One is that it needs a smaller model. The other is that it's trained purely on code, so it's not necessarily uh, required to be constrained by all the limitations of natural language. But effectively, we saw this one opportunity because we were trying to find a use case um, that open source models could use as a first victory against commercial models and within our understanding of the space. And another thing that we saw, and this is, comes back to our experience with open source security and, and so on, is that there was kind of this report by Stanford uh, in late December which talked about how the generated code was going to be insecure, right? And we had had that experience. Uh, Sakya so Zavera Code, I'm still at Scandis, it's a local cybersecurity startup, and it focuses on application security. And we've had the experience where, where end users and clients really struggle to fix vulnerabilities in their code. So those two things combined gave us kind of an interesting idea, which was like, since Bill in the Middle was basically editing code, and there was a concern about insecure code, even with generated code and otherwise, um, can we find a way to use open source large language models to fix vulnerabilities. And can we do it in a way that's potentially better than what's out there uh, from a commercial uh, large language model standpoint? And that's kind of the thesis of what we try to do. And to be honest, not me, most of the works in Western Care, I'm not half as smart as he is. Um, but this was kind of the idea that we're working on. And I think Asamkia will now talk about all the exploration that we did since then. All right, thanks, uh, Rohan. So when we looked at this problem back in you know late November, early December, there are there are very few models for source code which would actually do fill in the middle or uh, you know um, bug fixing, right? And one of the uh, models that came in December last year was this thing called Santa Cota. Uh, there are some attractive properties about uh, how they built and trained this. So first of all, it's actually from Big Code, which is this large uh, scientific open collaboration. Uh, it's backed by Hugging Face and uh, Service Now. Um, and the key difference among, uh, like, compared to what's, what OpenAI did or what others did, is that they trained it on uh, uh, data uh, data set where they respected the people's uh, licenses, right? So it's trained on uh, this data set called the stack. It contains uh, six uh, terabytes of uh, permissive data. So they scan data, uh, they analyze all the millions of repos, uh, but they extracted the licensing from the repositories, right? And uh, what you see is uh, the eventual uh, data set which came in after near duplication uh, actually consists only of these uh, set of licenses, right? So uh, one of the benefits is if you're using Santa Cota is that the code that it spews out is actually permissively licensed compared to say, you know, uh, OpenAI or whatever, right? So that that's one of the benefits. And the second thing is they actually have an opt out. So even if you are a you know open source developer and so they have this data set available. You can just submit your repository onto it, and uh, uh, the next time when they train the model for the next iteration, your code is removed from it, right? And they, I think they've done it quite, I would say once a month or so, so quite frequently. So if you really want your code not to be included, there is a mechanism to do it, right? And I don't know anyone else, even including commercial companies, which provide this, right? So there are a lot of attractive properties uh, of this data set and the model. Uh, it still is very diverse, so if you look at the terms of programming languages, so the checkpoints that they released in December uh, are for three languages, uh, Java, JavaScript, and Python were probably the three most common languages, but it has many different languages, the data set itself has uh, in it. And uh, now, like, <laughs> you want to mention about change since uh, December, right? So, uh, this is still a GPD-2 style model, which uh, is, uh, uh, at the time when it was released, it was competitive with what was available, uh, but probably today with you know GPT-4 or whatever, it's no longer as competitive, right, for code generation. So uh, this this was the base model which we started, and very quickly I'll just show you a little bit of how it uh, works. So let me go back here and hopefully. 
So, uh, so I just wanted to show you the, the demo that they have, right? And for some reason, it's settling out, right? Uh, but the good thing is about open sources that I could just, you know, I was sitting back there, I could just work it. Uh, and then this, uh, what was the issue? And then I could just run it here, right? So, um, the only problem is I don't have a GPU grant, so it takes a while to run. Uh, but one of the things to remember about this model is that it is not a like a dialogue model. So people who are very familiar with ChatGPT now, you can't expect it to you know say give me this or write this answer. You have to use it like code completion. So you start off writing either some box strings or you uh, write comments of what you want to do, uh, and then the model will actually generate it. So in this case, uh, let me just copy this over here, and what you can see is. Uh, Right, so I gave it a prompt and then it uh, generated this piece of Python for detecting all numbers, and then uh, I think this it just started on its own. Right. Uh, the good thing about this model compared to some of the others, the only other model which is open source which does infilling is encoded by Facebook. You can actually do infilling, so you can actually define a token here, so which will. So instead of actually just doing completion, you can actually say, okay, uh, you know, I think there's some bug here or there's something missing, and I want you to fill this uh, part here, right? Um, and then let's just wait for a few seconds. Hopefully, it will uh, fill a uh, right? So you see it generated the actual code earlier, right? So so this part where you can actually put in a token and do this uh, infilling, right? And that's important for the use case we want to use model for. So let me go back to my slides. Right. So um, when we looked at it, uh, we wanted to apply this uh, model for a particular downstream task. And the task that we had in mind was vulnerability fixing, right? Uh, the most common way to do it is using a supervised fine tuning. Right? So typically, uh, a GPT style model is uh, trained uh, using causal language modeling. So uh, you have some context on the left hand side, and then you have a place where you want to predict the mask, and then that's the token that you predict. So it goes from left to right. right? Uh, this is in contrast to something called mask language modeling, where uh, you may actually in the text itself have places where tokens are marked as marks, and then you write predict. Uh, what the token is, right? So, an example of a mass language modeling is a birth, uh, which is a uh, trained uh, with mass language modeling, right? So, then how I just showed you an example of how you could do infilling with uh, Santa Coder, right? So, how does a model which is a you know GPT 2 style can actually do uh, infilling even the trained with a causal language modeling? So, there's a technique uh, which came last year where people uh, what they did is they realized that you can actually convert uh, this infill kind of problem to uh, uh, causal language modeling problem. And what you do is you just take this token, right? You add some new tokens to say, okay, prefix, and then add some code, and then add some suffix, and then it's the middle. So what you do is you transform this by generating uh, another token. And then this is the problem that you give to the model. So it takes some code here, but eventually just you fill it back up from where you get, right? So you move the, you use special tokens to mark in the code what is the beginning and end of the text or the code. And then you bring it uh, back up, right? So we use this with the uh, with idea to do uh, to prepare a data set for bug fixing. So what we do is like we have some code, and then there's a buggy line. So for this work, we focused on single line fixes because it was just uh, simple and easy to do. Uh, but similar idea could be extended to multiple lines within the same context, right? So what we do is then we have to create some prompt. For the model to consider while fixing. So then we say, okay, there's a bug. This is the CWE. So these are all vulnerabilities. Uh, we comment the actual bug and then we put in a you know, fixed version uh, or the fixed line, right? And then we insert these uh, special tokens. So then we say, okay, this is the prefix. There is something in the middle and then there's a suffix and then there is end of text. Right? So all the data set actually consists looks like this. So, right? Um, to give you a more concrete example, so this is an actual bug in a, or a vulnerability in a Java program. So this is from our real CV. Uh, so we transform it. So this is the actual line of code which was there, right? Uh, and then we add this bug, and then another fixed line, and then we insert the actual fix. Right? So this whole thing is actually the input for training. So 
our end data set consists of uh, examples like this, right? Uh, and then you can train it uh, in a standard way because it's a GPT-2 style model. So you can use the, you know, there's a special fine tuning script which the code has provided or you could use the usual hugging face transformer script. Uh, you just need to be careful that you need to add these special tokens in. Otherwise the model will not know what these stand for. Right? So make sure you have special token in and then uh, you can run it, uh, you can run it on single uh, GPU very easily. Right? So this is just a test from which I have from uh, Cola, right? So we took a CVM fixes data set, which is published last year, and from which we extracted these single line fixes. So that's the uh, data set on which uh, we trained our, or fine tuned our model. Uh, the data set is available. We call it the model the Santa fixer, right? So this is uh, the model which has been uh, fine tuned for fixing. Now, uh, once we had this, we realized that, and this is now again, quite popular with the whole uh, chaining and you know giving language model tools. Uh, but what we could do is you could combine a static analyzer with a large language model to automatically detect and fix vulnerabilities, right? So the way it works is that you have some input, right? You scan it with a static analyzer, it finds some vulnerability, then you use the language model to prompt it and then generate a fix, right? Uh, then you take a fixed input and then scan it again with the same analyzer and you continue with this until you uh, find that it's been fixed, right? And then you have the fix. So in our work, uh, we built a uh, tool which is also open source, and I'll show you in a minute how it works. Called Robotics, uh, we use it, which is a open source static analyzer. Uh, and for the uh, large language model, we use Santa Fixer. Uh, but uh, basically, you could use any combination. You could use a commercial static analyzer, or you could use another uh, model to do the generation. You could even use a open uh, AI's uh, API to actually if you want to generate code, right? Uh, but the idea is that you use this closed loop uh, to generate uh, different options and then uh, keep scanning continuously with your analyzer okay, until you finally fix the problem, right? So let me give you a quick uh, view of how it works. So the tool is open source. You can actually go ahead and get it. There's some instructions on how to use it. Uh, I'm going to just run this. Here and uh, while I talk about it, hopefully by the time we are on, I would have a fixation. Right. So, so here's an example to show you the Java one. So this is an actual one. So, so there is actually a vulnerability here. Uh, there's a parameter which comes in, and then you're directly creating a file from it, and then this could be an issue. So if you run it. Uh, it creates an intermediate, you know, the prompt file. So first it will detect the vulnerability, and then uh, we generate this kind of prompt. So say, okay, this is the vulnerability. You are not restricting uh, the path name to directory. This was the line which is commented, and then it prompts the model to actually uh, infill or fix the path user in failure, right? Uh, and eventually, uh, once it's finished, it would have something like this. Right. So then we actually generate into the code here. So instead of directly the image, it, you know, puts it into an attribute and so on. Uh, I'll give you an example from this, which might be more. Okay, so here we have, uh, we're using MD5 hash, right? So when we scan it, uh, we would see that sender could actually flag it as deep use of token of So it would say, okay, this is MD5, you should use it, and then it would prompt it to fill. And then when you See how it is eventually uh, fixed. Um, we have the fix here. So it actually says we use a char. Right. Um, so this is still running. Let me go back here. Let me show. Let me so this is still running. So but it's actually quite nice to watch. This fix in real time is an example I recorded from. Earlier, so you can see that we modernize uh, uh, various combinations and uh, keep on iterating uh, until I find something where the uh, static analysis will not uh, lack a vulnerability. Okay. So, back. okay, so running, maybe we'll come back. Oh, did I fix it? So you can see it's actually trying out different combinations. So this is the example that I just gave in. Right. So 
So I think the issue here is that uh, this is coming from a request parameters or anything, and then uh, it's been passed in the response to it. And you can see it's fine out various combinations. I don't think it worked this time. Okay, so let me go back. All right. All right. So so we built this, and then we wanted to see like you know how how good or how well it would uh, work in practice. So we um, we tried to test it on a data set of uh, vulnerabilities from top uh, thousand projects on GitHub to scan using uh, Semgit, right? And this uh, data set is also something we have published. Um, so on that, what we see is so typically the way you would have seen the results are reported as like pass at one and pass at ten. But what it means is that uh, uh, pass at one means that you just take one generation output, and so it's able to fix like 25% uh, with just one pass or one output. Uh, but if you do typically 10, uh, the, like the one which I showed you in default, by default we do 10, it can actually fix half of the thing in various languages, right? Uh, I didn't have the <laughs> capacity of the GPU to try pass at 100, which is uh, also some metric people uh, typically report, right? Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So the model as well as the tool, it's uh, open source, it's available. We just published it uh, this week, so I'll invite you guys to try it out. And that's our talk. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, so I'm guessing this was mentioned to do this with this free run local um, on small on small auto bits. Yeah. And so what's since you designed it, what's your ideas for um, making more portables that way? Um, response times are fast, or the runtime is faster than the ports. So we all get a quick feedback loop. Yeah, so I think uh, one thing is, I mean, I don't have a GPU, so it runs fairly. So this is running on my CPU. So oh, whatever you said, so it's already, so this particular model, it's not too bad because like I showed you, it's still a GPU 2 style model. So it has like less than close to 1 billion parameter, right? So, uh, but there are things which uh, uh, just today, I think in the latest release of Hugging Face Transformers, there is a, a GPT big, uh, which is a fast instance based. Uh, Transformer, which actually is being contributed by Santa Bora, that will actually speed it up quite a bit. Uh, there is some other work people have done, which we have not tried, with the around seeing how you can actually compress some of the weights. So, idea would be if you can take a model like this, which is fine tuned on a very specific problem, so like vulnerability fixing, and reduce it to say you know less than 50 MB or something, so then I can put it in my Visual uh, uh, Studio Code as a plugin, right? So, uh, I think it's possible, uh, but we haven't like spent too much time uh, on that. Uh, but what you saw today is just uh, CPU. So GPU is actually fairly uh, fast. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So uh, just go back to the whole chat. So you you were talking about a GPT two style model. Uh, are you training from scratch? Uh, I said you know the, no. the base models, yeah. uh, which I think just talk about ethical data set. Right? So it was that ethical data set trained from scratch, or were you yes. some kind of so oh, okay. the big code collaboration. Train the Santa Coder model from scratch uh, on the the stack, the data set, which is the 60 TV or permissive data set. Right? Okay. Uh, we fine tuned it from there to a particular downstream problem. Okay. Yes. But the original model, the Santa Coder is, and that is the only one which I know has been like it's you, you can't get code which is not permissive there because that's not playing out. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you, uh, uh, where, where, where do you see uh, human AI collaboration going uh, in, as far as programming language evolution is concerned. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you have any ideas? Uh, yeah, I think we've done the first in a while. So, we we talked about it. Um, Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Like, so, so, the question is, where do you see human AI collaboration? And I think, I think, as it stands right now, um, you can't let these tools run unsupervised, right? Even for example, the pass of ten that we're doing here. Uh, it only makes sure that the study analyzer no longer says it's vulnerable. But you might have broken the entire code because as a result. So who knows, right? So, so there's still a lot of kind of supervision, human supervision re required, even if you are running the AI to do all the coding. Even if you don't write a single line of code, I think you still need supervision. And I think I personally don't see that going away anytime soon, especially for code maintenance. Writing new boilerplate code, yes, it's going to be largely unsupervised, uh, but that is never the problem when you go to large organizations, large projects. I think the the the, the maintenance and the I think Sanjay has some ideas on this as well. You need models that are trained on that, and then even then they will need supervision. So I mean, I think people get really freaked out about 
this with like, every day there is some new you know set of tools and chains and people talking about auto gpt and you can just tell the model what through it keeps running i think they're getting a little ahead of themselves so all those cases that you see they're actually very very simple so i'll believe it when i see you know a large language like, model able to install i don't know nvidia driver on a new jetpack i mean can it install you know? i mean it took hours for me to so those were actually familiar to make this work or, so I would believe it if it can install the NVIDIA Jetpack on a you know embedded uh, device from scratch. It's 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 insane. So there's still a lot of room. There is it's I think for simple tasks, which I believe is maybe 80 percent of the development is like that. You know, take something from a database, display on a you know UI, and then maybe that's where it's shining. In, but there's a lot of scope. There's still a lot of room, uh, and there are ways in which we could improve. So one of the things we wanted to do was like we don't really learn from the failure of the like if it doesn't generate a fix like. Don't explain it. So one of the things we could do is to see, like, ask the model to explain why it failed. And do. But uh, in all this talk, like, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is a running joke. Like, if I would believe, like, if it could install uh, NVIDIA driver on a machine, because that's insane. The, if you have to do it, and because like at Secure I've worked with a lot of uh, embedded systems uh, recently, and you need a specific version of Python, a specific version of uh, people who do it are laughing, right? The uh, Jetpack with a specific version it takes. Two days for me to take a you know an actual device commercially from the go set it up and then build it to a point where I can run my code on it, right? So I think yeah, I think there's still a lot of room. So we uh, there it's it's in a very similar category to what you said like Stack Overflow at this point. So I use do I use it? Yes, I use it, but I use it as similar to how I would do like for look for some information, get something out, and then uh, do so. The other problem is. It's hard to actually get the model to what you really want if it goes down this path of like it keeps telling you the wrong thing, right? So I teach uh, at SMU. I just finished a course on computational thinking, and some of the problems there. I mean, like I'm traveling this on, so we teach about this heuristics and so on, right? So we try to ask it, and then try to change something in a way that you want, right? Like you would to another human, they would take that input and act on it. But if you try some of these models, they just keep going at this track, what they call like hallucination or whatever. It doesn't backtrack. So once it starts on a path. And every time you say it, you say I apologize. This is not correct, but it will just spit out something which is again garbage. So, uh, if, yeah, what I would encourage you to try it out. And what you realize for novel problems, for problems which probably is not being trained on, or you are trying to ask a uh, particular question, it's hard to get it to do what you want, right? Even today. So, I think yeah, despite all this progress, yeah.